creative director of Pretty Little Thing. Like, I'm not just an influencer anymore. This is just the start for me. I'm only 22. Like, I've got so much more to learn. We literally only are given one life. We have to just go to the extremes. I've worked my absolute arse off to get where I am now. A lot of people don't believe that, but I work, I spend time with my boyfriend and I go to bed. That is literally my life. I can't have anybody knowing where I live. I actually have close protection security now and really there's no price on feeling safe. That was like a really, really low moment for me. When we got back, it just felt cold and eerie and it just didn't feel like home anymore. It he could literally go away for weeks on end and there's not a doubt in my mind that if he was to be around a, a load of girls, I could sleep peacefully at night knowing that he's just, he's for me and I'm for him and that is literally the key. You've got trust, you've got everything. There's so much more to it than people see. They have no idea what really goes on. I mean, I would never say like I've had like a mental breakdown, but that was close to it because I just went crazy. <laughs> Molly May. She is, in my opinion, and according to a lot of the data, the UK's number one Instagram influencer creator right now. She started out many years ago on a show called Love Island, but many people have been on Love Island and nobody ever has had the meteoric rise in their brand, their career, their profile like Molly has. So as much as it's easy to say, well, okay, you know, she had a boost from Love Island, that does not explain what's happened in her life subsequently. So I wanted to sit down with her today and find out exactly what's driving her, what's caused this meteoric success, almost 10 million followers in no time at all, 25,000 new followers a day. Just imagine for a second being thrust to the number one spot in terms of influence and having tens of millions of followers online becoming a multi-millionaire overnight and being 22 years old. Imagine, imagine the mistakes you would make. It's absolutely fascinating. And the way she deals with it, I think you'll find incredibly inspiring. And what comes with that success? Recently, her house was burgled and she reportedly lost £800,000 worth of her possessions and had to move immediately to a new home. She now has to have 24-7 close protection security. And I'll be honest with you, this is something Molly and her manager and team shared with me before we started recording. Molly doesn't do interviews like this. So this really is, in many respects, her first real in-depth interview of this kind. And I can't wait for you to hear it. So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett. And this is the diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Hitchin. That's where you you grew up, right? Mm. Take me Hitchin. back to Hitchin. What was life like when you were growing up there? Hitchin. I I actually still am extremely fond of Hitchin, and it was a really it's a really really special place for me. I spent eighteen years there growing up in a very normal house with a very normal family doing very normal things in a very normal school not a private school or anything it was just an extremely normal um yeah area to live in I loved it and um I got my first job there I I had a lot of firsts there and um, I think it will always hold a special place in my heart I was a lifeguard there at a swimming pool for four years um I had a job in hairdressers I worked in a gym it was all going on in Hitchin that's where it all, all began obviously is the air family dynamics brothers sisters mum dad tell me about your your family what they do who they are what their character so I have one sister she's actually in the army she's three years older than me people are always shocked when I say I have a sister that's in the army because obviously it's so <laughs> so different to what I do um but I'm actually really proud of that I think it's it's um I never really say that but I'm super proud that she she is who she is and we've grown up to be such such different people but both parents were in the police so that was interesting growing up something else that I'm really proud of actually having two parents that are police officers because I don't know I quite liked it at school like sort of being known as a police officer's kid like I, I kind of liked it no one really messed with me <laughs> it was quite yeah like even at parties like I think even a couple of times my dad actually what when I remember one time my dad actually showed up to shut a party down that I was at um yeah so, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah it was um that kind of thing having um parents as police officers but I didn't mind it and at that age, when you're in Hitchin, what is it that you, you want to be when you grow up? Oh, God. I mean, 
I, I always wanted to be doing something different. I mean, I went to fashion school um, for two years because I really wanted to pursue a career in fashion. Um, all my friends sort of stayed on and, and went to sixth form and college. But I, again, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something outside the box. So I had an interview at the Fashion Retail Academy in London and I got a, got a spot there and I ended up going there for two years and studying there. I was commuting to London every day at like 17. Um, so yeah, it was outside my comfort zone, but I'm, I'm really glad I did that because it was just different. I love doing things that were different. And did you, did you have a, cause when I was younger, I wanted to be a dentist and then mm. a doctor and then a yeah. surgeon at one point. And then, you know, I bounced around and then I was like, I want to manage a business. Yeah. What, what were you saying to yourself in terms of what you would be when you were older? What you, did you have, was it fashion? Um, I think when I was younger, it was mainly performing arts. I've definitely got that performing arts streak in me I think a lot of people that sort of fall into being in the public eye do have a bit of like that performing arts streak in them because they have that confidence but I couldn't quite make it in that I tried auditions I tried you know castings all this but I didn't quite have that I wasn't quite there and I sort of accepted that very quickly and realized to do well in performing arts you have to be the best it's like the most cutthroat industry people say fashion's cutthroat no performing arts is like it's not industry you mess around in so I accepted quite quickly that that wasn't going to work for me so fashion was was where I focused on and I really did think that I was going to end up being like a fashion buyer for like a large business or that's that's kind of what I wanted to do. Your your mum and dad lived very um as police officers very uh solid yeah uh, lives and careers right yeah um, did you, at that young age, did you, cause I'm trying to understand from like a very young, young age. And I always ask this about myself, like how much of it was this kind of in, innate desire to have more and be different mm. and not live the standard life yeah. um, or how much of it is just, you know, following, following the heart and seeing, seeing where it goes. I think for me, watching my parents have a very ordinary life, it, it sort of petrified me a bit. It was like a bit terrifying, this thought of, I don't want to grow up in this house and and when I I'm old in my rocking chair I like tell my grandkids you know like I had this really ordinary life and I had an ordinary job I had an ordinary income like that it petrified me from I think around I reckon I started feeling that way from about 15 I realized like the world is literally our oyster and we can do whatever we want with the 24 hours in the day that we're given so why the hell am I not going to go out and like make the most of them and do crazy things and make them like as I said make the most of it so yeah I think my parents having this very ordinary job like I mean police officer it's not necessarily that ordinary but for me it was like it just terrified me I was like I don't want to have this life in Hitchin forever it's, I know that there's so much more to achieve and I moved to Manchester um when I was 18 and started my life there I just moved out I literally said to my mum one day I walked down into the living room I'll never forget it and I said I found this flat on right move and I'm moving to Manchester and she was like no you're not I was like no no I'm going she was like you don't have enough money I was like I'll find it like I'll make this work and I literally went within a week and I was gone. I packed all my stuff up and I just left. And I moved to Manchester. And I remember the first night in my apartment in Manchester in Ancoats, I was like, oh, what have I done? I was like, this was the worst move. I felt so homesick. It was horrendous. But then I settled in and it was the best thing I ever did. Looking back on it now. It was, um, were you moving for a job or you were moving just because I'd you were sick of I'd sort of, um, at that point, I sort of missed out a part. I'd sort of started to grow following on Instagram mm -hmm. and it was growing quite rapidly. Um, and I'd found um, a management in Manchester. So I just thought, I'm just going to go up there and just see what happens. Like what's the worst that can happen? And all sort of the fast fashion companies and everything was in Manchester at that point. It became like the new place to be. Um, so I just thought, let's go, let's do it. And yeah, I went by myself. No one believed that I was going to do it. And I just did. And yeah. I definitely couldn't afford my rent. My mum was right. I think if um, I'd stayed there any longer, I probably would have had to move back home at some point because I really couldn't afford my rent. I think it was like £900 a month and I was barely making £1,000 a month. So after my rent, I had about £100 to live <laughs> on. <laughs> and a Starbucks at that point is what, £5? Yeah. So it, um, but yeah, no, it was the best thing I ever did because obviously still in Manchester now and I don't plan on leaving. I love it. Do you, um, do you consider yourself to be, a, just thinking about that, taking that step, because mm. you can often see in people's journeys, there's that like one step into uncertainty where people think, well, I don't know why she did that or I wouldn't have done that myself. But your career seems to be riddled with these kind of steps into uncertainty. Yeah. Would you consider yourself to be a, at that age, especially a confident person? Yeah, I've always been extremely confident. I've never, ever struggled with um, my confidence, like even meeting new people, trying new things. Like I've never, I've never, I've never felt 
unconfident in any situation, which I'm really blessed to mm. have that. Like, even, you know, when I went on Love Island, like going to my auditions, super confident, always super confident in everything I do, everything I, I stand by, like I just have that confidence. And yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have that because I think it's something that just comes, you don't, you can't really mm. build on it. Like it's either there or it's not. Um, mm. So yeah, very confident person. Do you think you're, as you kind of like, so if we zoom forward a little bit, we'll zoom back, but as you zoom forward on this point of confidence, um, one of the things that I learned in my life is as I managed to do more things and achieve more things, I actually realized that the previous version of myself um, knew so little about the nature of the world. And I just want to like scream back at myself, oh my God, Steve, even though you were ambitious then and confident yeah. then, you were wrong. Like yeah. you can do even more. And you, it, it. Yeah. So as you, as you look back on that, that, you know, that young girl in Hitchin yeah. um, and other people who'll be in that situation, mm. I'm, I'm the same, I'm from a small town where mm. there's not a lot of, you know, yeah global dreaming no, going definitely on. Not. Um what what have you learned about the nature of like confidence and, and how it builds and how you how capable and how you know powerful your potential really is as you've boom 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 climbed yeah. up the ladder. I think it is just believing in in that Beyonce has the same 24 hours in a day that, that we do. And I just mm. think like it's literally you, you're given one life and it's down to you what you do with it. Like you can literally go in any direction. And when I've spoken about that before in the past, I have been slammed a little bit with people saying, you know, like it's easy for you to say that, you know, you've grown up and you've not grown up in poverty. You've not grown up, you know, with major money struggles. So if you to sit there and say that we all have the same 24 hours in a day, it's not correct. And I'm like, but technically what I'm saying is correct. We we do. So I understand that obviously we all have different backgrounds and we're all raised in different ways and we do have different financial situations. But I think if you want something enough, you can achieve it. And it just depends to what lengths you want to go to get where you want to be in the future. And I I'll go to any lengths. Well. Like I, I've worked my absolute arse off to get where I am now. A lot of people don't think that and believe that, but it's true. I've worked so, so hard. On that point of time and Beyonce, yeah <laughs> um, and that, kind of, that, uh, that kind of mindset of being very very um efficient with how you spend your time you must get a million requests to do everything mm. like i get a lot of requests you mm. must be getting pulled pushed uh, do this do that do how do you make the decision as to what is truly in line with who you are and where you want to go when you know I, like i don't think people understand thousands you're probably getting thousands of mm. requests dms opportunities some of them which you, i'm sure you love to do yeah but as you say 24 hours in a day yeah so how are you filtering that i think what you've just said is actually the key to why i've become successful in what i do is because it is so strict with what i do take on and what i don't take on my days are planned out to like the nth degree like it is so particular what work i'm doing and everything is done with such thought and like such um understanding behind it like I'm never taking on work that I don't understand or posting things on my socials that I'm not 100% behind or using like I think that is the key to being successful in in this industry and influencing if you want to call it like it's it's knowing what you're doing and knowing what you're talking about is is gospel like you're, you use those products you you stand behind what you're saying like I think that is why I've I have done well in what I and what I do because I am so believing in what I say and my, my followers know that like they they know that I'm not talking about something on my YouTube unless I use it unless I I believe in it and that is the key to being successful in this you have to have the trust of your audience so what work we take on is is honestly one percent of what comes in less probably mm. Fran gets I'm not even joking 800 emails a day mm. for work coming in it's it never stops she's on her emails from 500 from 5 a.m um going through work that comes in and it's you have to turn down so much to, to to earn that respect from your audience and earn that trust. And between you and your manager, Fran, do you then have to kind of initially agree where, where you want to go with your career, what your values are, what aligns with you? Yeah. And that kind of becomes the filter of these 800 messages a yeah. day. Is that the... Well, how, we, we set goals. We, we have like, Fran and I have like this sort of regular meeting every like six months or so and we we sit down and we we make a list of what I want to achieve and it used to be well at the start we were like going to do it every year but I'm I am achieving them rapidly now so we're doing it like every few months and creating new goals and setting new new targets of like okay, I want to work with this brand so if they've not reached to me Fran will reach out and lo and behold it normally happens where we we're a really really great team and I think having a manager that understands what your direction and what you want to do is utterly key because 
you know, it's, it's just so important. Like you can't do it alone. It's impossible. Like, okay, it's not impossible, but it's, I couldn't do it alone. No way. Mm. So um, having a manager that really, really understands where you want to go is just so, so, so important, I think. And there's a, there's a pretty remarkable long-termism to your mindset that I, I garnered from watching some of the videos that you'd made. One mm. in particular was the video where, you know, a brand has come along and offered you 2 million quid mm. to like be the face of their brand or do a yeah. partnership with them. Yeah. And Fran has presented you with that opportunity. Yeah. And you said, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Two million quid, Molly. Yeah, no, I said I would no. wear dresses. <laughs> if that brand is still looking for a, a face. <laughs> oh my God, that's so why, no. why did you say? Well, that's the thing. Like, as I just said before, like it, no amount of money can make me take a job that I don't believe in. If I'm not wearing the clothes, I'm not taking the job. No matter if they offered me five million, 10 million. And I, and I just so, solely believe that because the money will come from your audience, like appreciating that you didn't take that job. And if, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, I'd rather build that trust than, than take that money because the trust is what will earn you money in the future anyway. So I know that 2 million pound is going to come back to me at some point because I'll work with another brand that I do believe in instead. And my audience will see that and they'll buy into it. They'll like the picture. They'll engage with the content. Whereas they're not going to, if I took that, that brand deal before. So, cause mm -hmm. the audience see through, they're not stupid. Like pe people I follow on Instagram that I love when they do something that's not authentic, I see straight through it because you're the consumer, like, you know, and it's just, um, yeah, I think I did, I knew, knew you'd bring up that 2 million one because everyone was really fascinated by it. Mm. I think everyone was really shocked, but that's the side to me that people don't see. And I was really glad that me and Fran had that chat on my YouTube because it showed people that, you know, it's, there's so much more to it than people see mm. with, it, with this whole influencing thing. It's, they have no idea what really goes on. And my last point on this, uh, this point of you, you and Fran, one of the things I found actually quite, quite remarkable is, um, when, when you were coming down today and, you know, we were sorting out the, the logistics and those things, you and Fran stayed in the same hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. not typical of, you know, manager and client. Yeah. How but close are you, you and Fran? In we're literally room? like best friends. She's, I say like, she's like a second mum to me. Like it, it's grown that way because we spend like, we spend every day together. We're on the phone 24 seven. Like I speak to her more than I speak to Tommy. Absolutely. Like it's the constant, constant conversation. It never stops. If we're not on the phone, we're texting. If we're not texting, we're in person with each other. Um, yeah. So like even after the last few weeks, what's been going on Tommy and I, like Fran took us in, she's looked after us. It's, she's like my mum in Manchester. Like without her, I honestly don't know how I'd have got through the last few years of my life. Like she's, She's, um, yeah, much more than a manager. And I'm so blessed. I know it's not a normal situation for people to have a manager like that. And I know when you come out of a show like Love Island, having that manager that is on it is so yeah. key. It is honestly so, so key because without that, it can really, really fluff things up for you, which I've seen firsthand with so many people. And it's so sad. But yeah. So let's talk about that then. So Love Island. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it because I think everybody understands the show and the concept of it. But when you first were presented with the opportunity, and you're debating because a lot, you know, I, I think everyone's got a mate who says, oh, yeah, Love Island asked me to be on it. And I said, no, that nonsense. Right. When you first were presented with the opportunity, what was your incentive for saying yes? Well, it's, it's tricky. I've always struggled with how to talk about it because I answered a, few, a question once on my YouTube about was Love Island a business move for you? Like, And, I, and it is tricky for me to say the right thing without upsetting people. But put it this way, I didn't go on that show to find love. No mm. one does. People go on it for the experience people go on there for a, a laugh and I think because I went on there with a completely probably incorrect mindset that's why I did come out <laughs> with a boyfriend and I think because you know when you're not expecting something it mm. happens um but yeah I remember that it they came forward and I just thought at the time my influencing was going really well and there was actually a side of me that thought I can actually do this without going on this show like I know I'll be fine either way my following my following was growing rapidly like I think I was about 170,000 followers at that point and that was all organic growth there was no tv shows or anything and I hadn't had any friends of large followings that sort of posted me it was all very natural growth so I knew I'd I'd say now that if I hadn't gone on the show I'd probably be I'd like to say I'd be hitting a million followers um because I had that really good work ethic with my Instagram but the show just sort of it just elevated me and then I think one thing I always say is that when you come off that show, you're all on a level playing field and it's totally up to you where you go with it. And I just knew that I wanted to go uh, just to levels that no one had ever gone to. And that's why I never really speak about it because I just feel like I don't owe uh, it. That's not the reason why I am where I am now. Yeah, it gave me a platform. Yeah, it elevated me. But the things I've done now are not because of Love Island. They're because of me and what I've decided to do in my work ethic. 
So I want to drill down on that point then. So you're completely right. Um, Love Island is a platform, but the it's super, super clear that if you look at the outcome of everybody that's been on that platform, mm. the results are wildly varying. Mm. And um, you're, you've, you, you know, you're part of that platform. Yeah. But what's happened to you subsequently after you've been on that show yeah. is um, unprecedented. There's not been another example of someone who has risen so high following being involved in that platform. Yeah. So what is it about you and you know, your character, your, you know, whatever it might be. I don't want to put the answer in your mouth. What is yeah. it about you that's that's caused that? <sighs> so many different things. But I think I knew the minute I came off that show that I just wanted to do crazy things. And one thing for me is that when I reach one goal, it's what can I achieve next? It's never enough for me. And I think it's a bit of a downside to my personality because when I achieve something incredible, I, I just want more. I always want more. Like I remember I was speaking to Fran about this. I was like, I remember when my goal was, I really want to get a million pounds in my bank account. That's all I wanted to do. I was like, that is my goal. And then the minute, minute I reached it, I was like, well, I want two now. I want two million. And it's like, I never am happy with where I'm at. I'm constantly working towards the next thing. But I think you need that. You need that work ethic. You need that desire to always want more. It's never enough for me. Even when I got my biggest dream collabs and it's just what can I get next Fran's sick of it as well she's like it's enough now <laughs> come on yeah, like. I, you know, and <laughs> when someone hears that they might think well how do how do you how do you be happy and satisfied and content mm, mm. whilst always striving to yeah. have more and more and more and once you get to that mountain top or what you thought was the mountain top they call it like a fal false peak in climbing where you get yeah. to that, that bit and then you look up and there's more to go yeah and you can, and so how do you find the happiness amongst and amidst the climb. Yeah, I'm working on that, I think, because even recently that like, we moved in into a new place, we moved into this new house and I've realised I've actually got a bit of a problem with it because I was like, this house is literally a dream. It's a dream, but it's not enough for me because I still want more. Like, I still want a bigger house. I still want bigger things. And it's like, I need to work on that because you do need to find that happiness because you know, 16, 17 year old me is screaming at the things I'm doing right now. And I'm still like, it's not enough, you know? Yeah. But I think that's why I, I'm doing the things I'm doing and I am achieving great things because it's, I'm never sort of like, okay, yeah, I'm happy this week. I'll just sit down and, and this is fine. No, it's like, what are we doing next week? It's, it's always more. Why do you think you want more? I, what I, does it, what emotionally, psychologically in the mind, what, what, what is it that's saying that more why is more important I think again going back to that point where like when I when I'm older and I've got my kids around me and I, I want to literally look back and say like my life was unbelievable like I did every single thing I could possibly ever want to do there's not one thing on my list that's not ticked and I think I'm not there yet and I know I can achieve more because it's possible so why not like we literally only are given one life we have to just go to the extremes and that's what I'm trying to do I am um... I'm, I'm very much the same in many ways. And over the years, I think I got to a point where my book is called Happy Sexy Millionaire because at 18, I wrote in my diary, Range, bear in mind, I was living in Moss Side and didn't have a driving license. <laughs> a Range Rover Sport will be my first car. I'll make a million before I'm 25. I'll have a girlfriend and I'll have a six pack, basically, right? That. That's my life goals. 25, Brilliant. Brilliant. 24, I'm driving a Range Rover Sport. I'm a millionaire, whatever, whatever, whatever. Amazing. And then that anti-climax of getting there. Yes. This like feeling of, Where's the marching band and the confetti? Like it's, I thought, it's a huge anticlimax, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's it's mental. Like don't get me wrong, it's incredible to reach your goals, but it is a little bit. Oh, it, you, you know when you hear people, the, the richest people in the world, and they say you're not happy though because you have all this money. You think yeah, you are happy. Like of course you are. You've got all this money, but they're probably not because it really actually doesn't mean anything. All of that stuff. Your happiness comes from within and the people around you and your life. It doesn't come from how, how much money you have in your bank and what car you drive and what house you live in. It really doesn't. It sounds cliche, but it, it, I've, I've learned that. And I'm only 22 in it and I've realised that straight away. I'm like, oh gosh, yeah. okay. Yeah. It actually doesn't come from all this stuff. It comes from your mental state and, and your family and that the more important stuff, really. Mm. The non-superficial stuff. That anticlimax is very real though. And my, my concern, as you've said there, is like, I just was scared that I'd never be happy if I'm not happy now. Because yeah. like, this is, you're like, I think for both of us, from what you said anyway, this is the dream mm. that Hitchin Molly May yeah. dreamed of. And you and Hitchin Molly May at 17 said, when we get there at 22, we're going to be happy, I yeah. promise you. I'll sit on my sofa and I won't work another day and I'll be happy and I'll just, it's not that way. It isn't. You think it will be. And don't get me wrong, it's incredible and I'm so happy. I'm the happiest I've ever been. I, I don't want for more, but I do. 
if that yeah. makes sense. I don't know. Have you got a lot of friends? No. I don't. That's a, that's a blunt question. Yeah, no. I, There's lots I, of blunt questions here. <laughs> <laughs> um, straight up, no. No, I don't. My circle is minuscule. I have literally about five people in my circle and that includes friends. I have acquaintances and I have people in my life that I, I say are my friends, but I no, I, my circle is absolutely tiny and I like it that way. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I work, I spend time with my boyfriend and I go to bed. That is actually my life. And I'm not bothered about a social life. It's never been something that I've been interested in. I don't know if you've like, I don't know if you know, but I, I don't really drink. I don't party. I don't go out. But that is just because I actually don't enjoy it. It's not for me. I'd rather just focus on making money, being successful and and being happy. That's friends, they, they come and go. And mm. I just, I find it a waste, of, a bit of a waste of time. So you don't, you don't actively want more friends? No. Yeah. No, it's, it's time consuming. Like trying to make people happy. Like I've lost a lot of friends, but since coming off Love Island, because I don't have the time. And I, and in the end, I just say, do you know what? Look, like I'd rather focus on the things that are actually going to elevate me. And, and it sounds savage, but sometimes friends, they mm. just not cling on, but they, they don't add much. Add value, yeah. Yeah. I know it sounds a bit savage, but... No, it's true. And especially when you evolve as a person, you kind of sometimes, I think, you lose the thing that made you resonate with certain people. Yeah, and you can't, you can't 100%. Relate to them and well, I'm not that girl from Hitchin anymore. And, all, you know, like, I'm not that young girl that was a lifeguard at Hitchin Swimming Pool. Like, that's not me. I, I, I've, I'm i living a completely different, in a different world now. And a lot of my friends can't relate to that. And even though I'm still the same person, my life and my circumstances, they're just so different that you do just naturally... Just people just fall off, don't they? But I've, friends have never, I've never needed lots of friends. It's mm. just something that I've never really needed. And people pick up on pick up that about me really quickly. They just say like, "You've got your circle so small." Mm. Bit of a loner, but I like it. I, I you know, I, I asked that question in part because every successful person I've sat here with doesn't have a lot of friends. No, and you know, I was actually having a conversation with one of the previous guests on this podcast, and she's got two and a half million followers on Instagram. And she was telling me last night that she has one friend, it's her boyfriend. Yeah, and sounds she, about like, right. I, I, she literally said, I have one friend and it's my boyfriend. Yeah, and, that, sounds, that sounds about right for me. And it's sometimes, it's weird because when I ask people this question, it feels really uncomfortable. Yeah, well, when you first said it, I was like, oh God, no, I don't. But it's, yeah, it's it's a weird one because you don't want to sound like you you don't have any friends because then people think, well, you're probably the problem then. Do you know what I mean? Like you're pushing people away, but it isn't that. It's just like, I haven't got the time. Like I'd, I really would rather just spend time with Fran because we're friends and we talk about work and we get, we, you know, we, we make money. And then I spend time with my, with my boyfriend because he's amazing. And I doesn't, you don't need to force the conversation. You'd have to go for dinners and split the bill. Right? It's just yeah. like, oh, it sounds yeah. terrible, but I just don't have the time for it. I just, I'm lazy with it. Has it become hard to trust people, um, especially following, you know, your meteoric rise mm. in the public eye? Does it get more difficult to trust, yeah, people? Because they're always, you know, people are always, well, sometimes people are in it for themselves. They're trying to sell stuff, up, stories about you, or they're trying to yeah. take advantage. Or, yeah, you know. I've been quite blessed with my rise in that I, because my circle has always been small. I've not really had to cut people off because they're, you know, selling stories to the press. I've never had that. Mm. I mean, that I know of anyway. Um I mean, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, you, you do have to be wary about who's in your life because I, I think Fran always says this to me. She's like, you just think you're still that 17 year old girl from Hitchens. Sometimes you're not. And people will come into your life for the wrong reasons. But I think I'm a bit naive to that sometimes. And that is another mm. reason why I keep my circle so small because it's different now. I think the pe it's just, it's hard, to, it's just it's hard to trust people. I am. Um, I was watching something you, you said about how you've been very open about sharing the lows and the highs that yeah. have come with... Um, your meteoric rise and the publicity and being in the public eye that it's it's very easy to see a lot of the clear upsides right mm. the nice things the mm. like general sense of i'd say like freedom to choose freedom of choice in your career and stuff like that but what are some of the like trade-offs of that success which you just think oh that sucks well there's a lot there's lots obviously i've dealt with a lot in the last two years in terms of i, I was trolled extremely badly I mean it's like a cliche topic and I and I don't really talk about the trolling a lot because it's I feel like it's all anyone talks about on social media these days is trolls and trolling and but it it, it did happen to me extremely badly and there was this one time we went to Barbados to shoot a campaign for my fake tan business and um we were followed the whole 
trip by paparazzi we didn't even realize and they were posing as like architecture um photographers in front of this building and and I did think at one point I was like is that guy taking pictures of me but I just thought he's taking pictures of the building behind me there's no way in Barbados that Mm. they're gonna be taking pictures of me anyway that afternoon um me stood in this white bikini like completely like they were just the most horrendous pictures in my eyes and I I actually rang the Daily Mail myself I went through to someone on customer service and I just was like this is Molly May you must take those pictures down now like I was hysterically crying and I was and this poor person on customer service was probably just like what is going on and I was just screaming down the phone like please like you've ruined my life like look at the comments under that picture like please take them down and it was just like when I look back at that now I, was, I mean I would never say like I've had like a mental breakdown but that was close to it because I'd lost I, I just went crazy I was like screaming screaming down the phone at this personal customer service that could do anything about it. But for me, I was like, this is going to make it better. Like if they take them down, it'll all go away. But that was like a really, really low moment for me. Um, Probably like the lowest of coming out of the show. It was horrendous. It was just horrendous. Like people calling me fat, um, overweight and I'm a size eight. So like it just, it made me so upset to think that if people are calling me overweight, you know, a girl, a very normal size 10 girl, like what are they going to be thinking if, if I'm being called fat? Like it's, it's heartbreaking. And I think the whole trolling thing, like I have kind of dealt with it now. Like I'm really good at dealing with it. I sort of have this approach of like, if it doesn't matter, like people can say what they want to say. These people are just genuinely so unhappy in their lives that they try and bring you down. And it's so sad, but um, you do learn to deal with it. It's just part of it. And we've really, we've learned in terms of like, we're, we're on, always on Pat Watch now. And if we go away on campaigns, like we literally have someone that's job is specifically to look out for people taking pictures. So it doesn't happen again. Cause it was, it was quite bad that for me. Those Daily Mail comments really are a cesspool of just vileness. I remember when I was announced as a dragon on Dragon's Den. And like, I don't look at comment sections because I'm just really not bothered. It's like not going to add to my life. But then my family calling me and being like, oh my God, those yeah. comments. My mum does that to racist. me. <laughs> I'm like, don't look at them. My mum <laughs> like, my mum does that to me. She goes, have you seen the comments on Daily Mail? I'm like, mum, why would you tell me that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. you don't look. I'm not looking, yeah. so neither do you. Like, just leave yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah, I think obviously they're just looking out for you and they don't understand that you're probably just trying to avoid it. That's a pretty remarkable way to live. Is it? You're talking about, you know, being on holiday and having someone on Pat Watch and... Mm. you must always be on edge yeah like, you to are some degree. you are always on edge and it's it's a weird way to live but it's become normal now it's been two and a half years and that was really early on in Barbados that was I think maybe three months four months after I'd come out of the show and that was okay this is how we need to live now this is how we need to do things and it's just been the same and having an incredible team as well to to be protective of you is is I'm really lucky for that because I, I couldn't do it by myself. It is, you know, really vulnerable. Like it's such a vulnerable job to have. Mm. Um, and yeah, perhaps posing as architect photographers, like it's just, <laughs> there's snakes everywhere. <laughs> yeah, man. Before we started recording, Fran, your manager, told me that you are a little bit of a perfectionist and that you care a lot about getting all the details right for your customers, but across your life generally. Mm. So I guess my question to you is, how do you do that? How do you, dare I say, worry about details and also still maintain your peace of mind? Uh, I mean, it's it's compartmentalising it. It's sort of like I... I don't really switch off. It's almost like I just, it's sort of built into my mind. It's a 24 seven. It's, I'm always, always thinking in the back of my mind how everything I'm doing is affecting my work because that's, I am my job at the end of the day. Like I'm Molly May and Molly May is what's make, make, what makes me my income. It's not like I go to work and I come back and I switch off. I, I'm 24 seven on my phone. Yeah. So everything I'm doing, everything I'm saying, one story post that takes two seconds to post, everything I do affects how I make money, how my audience perceives me. So it's, I just think I've just sort of like, I don't know, it becomes one. My life is just, is. It sounds chaotic, right? And it it also sounds like, I find it pretty remarkable based on people I've spoken to that live in a similar way that are very neurotic and that are always on and always thinking. And then are in the middle of the like social media, instant feedback bubble. Yeah. How do you avoid being anxious in that, that, within that (sighs) cauldron? you you really just have to sort of accept that Instagram is Instagram and there's always going to be that one person on Instagram that that doesn't like what you're doing I've got 6.2 million followers it is impossible to please everybody so I've really had to understand that you know everything I say and everything I do not everyone's going to like it no matter how much I wish they did because it would put my mind at rest a lot knowing that everybody loves what I'm doing there's always going to be that one person that that hates what you're doing and, and hates you so you just sort of have to 
sort of understand that Instagram is, is just, it's very superficial and it's just a highlight reel. That's why I love my YouTube as well, because I feel like my YouTube is so behind the scenes. It's, you really get that, that bigger picture. You see the bad stuff that's happening in my day. And I think, do you know what? I think not to sound big headed, but I think that is why I have a really high engagement on my Instagram is because my followers, they they see me on YouTube and they see that picture on Instagram and they think, we know that she's not actually had a good day. Mm. We know that she's actually, I spoke about a few months ago how I wanted this really, really incredible job opportunity and I didn't get it. And I'm really transparent. Like I'm like, today's been crap. I've cried today. Like I've come on my period today. I'm feeling really rubbish today. Like I'm, I'm really, really transparent. So I think when they see that picture on Instagram, they know actually if we want to see a bit more of like a realist, side mm -hmm. here we'll just go to our youtube and have a look and i love that that is why i to all my influencer friends i say start youtube start youtube if you want your engagement to grow if you want your audience to fall in love with you if you want people to understand you more you have to start youtube because instagram is it's, it's nothing it's a mm -hmm. picture i post one picture a day what's anyone going to learn from that picture nothing youtube is where it's at that's where they learn that's where they engage with you and understand you and believe in you and that's the depth right yeah if you don't yeah. it's so important like I do YouTube because I love it. I I still edit all my own content. Really? I still, yeah, I, I'm wow. really, I love it. I actually find it um, therapeutic editing my videos. And I love um, when I finish editing a video and I upload it, I love that sense of, I just created that. Mm -hmm. And it's bigger than just editing an Instagram picture and putting it through color tone and putting a filter on it. You've spent time developing that video and you've created it and millions of people are gonna go and watch that and spend their 20 minutes of their day watching that video that you've created. And I love that feeling. That's really special. And I've had so many video editors, editors say like, oh, I'll do it. And I would never give that job to someone else. One of the things I find really fascinating, and it's linked to what you said there about being very honest and open with your audience. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, again, if we're talking about things that feel like they don't marry together or they feel like contradictions is as you rise and rise and rise, and as you experience more like material success and you can buy nicer things, do you become less relatable to your audience? And is this, a, is this something you think about? Because... The girl, you know, that is 16 right now living in Hitchens, looking up at you and you're getting, you're getting apparently further and further away from being, you know. That's such an interesting question. If when you say that, then I was like, that's a, a really valid point. And I actually, don't get me wrong, I'll be honest. I do see comments on my Instagram saying like, you know, can you do like a more high street haul this week? Can you talk about more high street clothes? Because don't forget in that 6 million followers, there's such a wide variety of people there's that 45 year old mum that's you know living on food stamps that's, you know and she's got no money and she wants to see me post really normal things but then I've got probably another girl that's following me an 18 year old girl that dad funds their life and they want to see the glamour it's there's it's such a it's impossible to mm. to sort of cater for everyone I try mm. and as I sort of as you say as I sort of my life is changing so much. I still try and stay as relatable as possible. And I, and I do, I, I, I would say that I am still extremely mm. relatable. And again, that's my YouTube. I post yeah, all these incredible things that I buy on my Instagram and I've sort of stopped doing that now, but I, I well. Oh, because it's yeah, fine. Yeah, but um, I I sort of, that's again, my YouTube is I'm, I'm there's, in a vlog, I might be saying, oh, I've just bought this brand new watch. It's amazing. It's cost X amount and I'm having a really great day. But then I also might say, oh, you know, I've me and Tommy just had a huge argument and I've walked out of the house. I, there's, it's in a vlog, I try and keep that mm. balance as much as possible. So I can sort of, mm. not because I cater for everyone. It's just because I, I am that way. Yeah, Life is be, that, that way, yeah. you know, when you're being honest, yeah. one minute something's really great. The next minute something's really shit. And that's just the way it is. And I guess there's, there's two forces there really, because I think if I was, um, well, not even, but if I was following you, it'd be for two reasons, right? For me, on one hand, it's aspiration. It's, oh my God, look at this amazing thing, all these amazing things she's achieved. And I really aspire to be there one day. But then obviously the relatability comes from the fact that you're talking about how bad your period pains are mm. and this problem with your boyfriend. And those are things we can all relate to. Yeah. And then on the other hand, there's all these wonderful things that we can all aspire to. Yes. And I think at, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's interesting with social media because a lot of people in your position wouldn't share the aspirational things because they'll care too much about what people might say. Yeah. Right? I would actually say the opposite. I would say, I think a lot of people share the aspirational things, but they don't share the low moments. That's true. When, That's I, true. when I'm when i watching people's YouTubes, I'm seeing so many girls being like, 
my life is just so amazing and I do these amazing things and I'm a vegan and I eat clean and I go to the gym and they don't talk about the low moments and they wonder why their audience isn't engaged. Mm. You have to be honest and you have to include those things that maybe you don't really want to include it, but your audience will appreciate that because that girl is probably also having a crappy day that's watching it. So she wants to see you also having a crappy day. So she knows it's okay. Mm. And that's where I think some influencers and some YouTubers, they, they fall down because they don't they're not 100% honest, whereas mm. I really, really am. And I stand by that. Um, so, yeah. If you buy something really expensive, though, let's say you buy something really, really expensive. When you go to post it, is there, an, uh, is there a feeling of, like, concern about it, it might make some people feel, you know, that struggling might make them feel bad or ina inadequate in a way? Yeah. I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? It's, it's hard to know what you're going to, what you post, how it's going to affect people. Like you might think that posting one thing will have no effect on somebody, but actually it could be all that person thinks about that day. And it's kind of scary. It's a massive responsibility because I have super young followers as well. And I've got to be careful. You know, I've been on a bit of like a health journey recently. I've got to be so careful talking about weight loss and what I'm eating because you don't know what you're saying. It's so impressionable. Yeah. And these young girls, they're so again, vulnerable. And I know when I was watching girls' Instagram stories, I mean, I'm sure I'll talk to you about filler in a bit, but I, Instagram was the reason I ended up getting all that filler because I was watching these girls' stories thinking they have filler. So I need to go and get filler. So if I'm posting about, you know, a health journey and I've lost a few pounds, I feel great. Well, then young girls are going to go and think, well, I need to go and lose a few pounds if Molly May's done it. So everything you're saying, it has to be so clearly thought about because it's, you have no idea how that one tiny story is going to affect that person's day with everything. Isn't there a lot of things though where you just can't, you can't, there's no way to get it right. You can't control it. No, you can't get it right all the time. I feel like there must be so many things where if you post it, you're going to get back. Because I, I experience it a little bit. People, it's funny with with um, with me. I, I tend, And I've learned this again from my guests that I've sat here with. I can get away for some reason with a, with a lot more yeah. than they can. So I can post something and I'll typically get like pretty much 100% positive. Like a good example actually was when um, I'd been in the gym a lot. And I'm saying to Grace, who's in my content team, I'm like, I'm going to post a topless photo and say, like, show my gym transformation before and after. And Grace raises it to me that, like, a lot of influencers who do that get, like, slammed for, you know, what, what you're saying. You're saying six pack is yeah, healthy. Yeah, I'm like, no one's going to say that in my audience. I post it. Everyone's clapping. Everyone's yeah, like, amazing. Give us wild, your tips. It's wild, isn't it? But it seems to be, like, almost a double standard it for, is, for, for women, maybe. creators and women like yeah. you who... If I look at it and think, oh man, you got, it's like a minefield of correctness. Well, I know, honestly, but that is another reason why I, I stay quiet on a lot of things. I don't, I'm often fearful to speak. And even on Twitter, I kind of stopped using my Twitter because everything you say, like you, I remember a few, a few months ago, I went to Italy for um, a trip and I mentioned that I'd, I didn't like the food in Italy and the way I worded it probably wasn't it I probably could have worded it better but I was trending on Twitter for four days about how I said I didn't like the food in Italy and and I was like literally going through a really hard time I was like I can't deal with this like I've I've made one comment that people didn't like about the ice cream in Italy and, and I'm literally trending and I'm getting like death threats because of it and it's a lot it's a lot like it's how and I mean I always say like when I don't have like a scandal for a while I'm thinking god a scandal's coming soon I'm going to say something wrong soon like it's, it is you're kind of always on the edge of like what's going to be next like what's what's happening next so with all this you know when you say this to me my like I've got to be honest I don't envy that situation mm. because I think one of the forms of um one of the real causes in our society and in the world of mental health issues is feeling like you can't be your true self yeah and there are physical forms of imprisonment putting someone in a jail and then there are mental forms of imprisonment which is like stopping them speaking freely about who they are who they love what they think and what they feel and yet when in every interview that I've encountered with you the answer I see is I'm very very happy mm. How, can, how how is how is that all possible for you to live in a world where there is so much concern and so many minds that you could possibly step on and to still be happy? I know. I am always saying that I'm happy because how I think it'd be selfish for me to say that I'm not. Like, how could I not be happy? Like, 17-year-old me creeps back up then because I'm thinking like, God, sh I am happy because this is all I ever wanted. And yes, every day in my mind, I think, God, I've, I have got these worries and I have got these struggles, but let's just take a step back. I am happy. Like I, I sort of have to just, 
look at the bigger picture. I'm healthy. I have my health, my family's well. I have an incredible manager. I have an incredible boyfriend. I live in a beautiful house. I'm safe. I'm happy. Like I am. Yeah, I've got all these these worries about when am I next going to have a scandal? When am I, when am I next going to say the wrong thing? And it, But in the bigger picture, like 17 year old me, again, could only dream of this shit and I'm living mm. it. So that's how I look at it. And that gratitude, you know, it's clearly so important to be yeah. centered and grounded amongst all of this chaos, right? Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, I am very grounded. And I think that's one thing that I'm proud of is that everyone that knows me from my life prior to Love Island, they've, they've all said I've never changed. I've always stayed the same. Yeah, my life, my circumstances have changed, but me, myself, I've, I'm a, the same person and I and I know I am. I've never become bougie. I've never yeah. become like, I've, I've never, you know, I just, I couldn't, it's not me. I am that, I am still that girl from Hertfordshire, but just with a very different life now. Mm. But I, I've never changed. Even then, since I've met Fran in that two and a half years, I'm still the same person that she met on that day when I came out of Love Island. So yeah, I stand by that. And I'm, I'm proud that I've stayed the same. What are these drinks here? <laughs> so this is Huel. They're the, they're the, they're, um, it's basically nutritionally complete food. So it's, um, it's the fastest growing e-commerce company in the country. Oh, is it? Yeah, wow. online and internationally. It's basically like, it's like your, your perfect meal in a drink. So 20, you know, all your proteins, all your vitamins, all your minerals, oh, vegan, okay. gluten-free. And if you're ever on the, I'm sure you are, because you're super busy. If you're ever on the go and you're like skipping meals and stuff. Yeah. You have one of these, fills you and make sure that you get all, everything you need. Amazing. So I think as the world has got busier, Huel has got more popular, you know, but anyway. Right, I have to um, try Huel. Yeah, we'll give you, we'll Thank give you a couple you. Of, They actually send you a big package after this. They always do it, so. Oh, okay. Um, not that anyone knows where you live now. We'll just really no, no, thing, no, but we'll talk about yeah. Fran <laughs> barely knows where I live. <laughs> yeah. We'll send it to Fran, she can put it on. <laughs> Speaking there about social media and, you know, one of the changes you made and you've, you've talked about this publicly is you removed the cosmetic filler from your face, mm. right? Yeah. And um, and other things, you know, other sort of changes to your sort of cosmetic appearance. Can you talk to me first about what it was that made you want to go and get cosmetic filler in your face? Well, I think... When you're I, clearly very beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I was seven, 16 or 17 when I first got filler. And 16, if it was, I think is actually illegal. Um, I think you have to be 17 legally. Um, but I I went and got lip filler when I was around 16 and it didn't stop for a few years. I, I kept getting it and I kept getting it. And it became, around that time was when it had become very normalized. Filler was, it was literally like going to go into the gym. Like, I'm just going to go and get a top up of my lip filler. It became so normalized, which is terrifying and so scary that, these things are spoken about on social media, like these these um, aesthetic pages. They're posting all these packages you can get with filler, and it's it became really normal. So I just I went one day and I just got it, and it was like nothing. And I didn't tell my mom. I just kept it from everyone. No one even really noticed. But I think on social media, as I said before, I was seeing all these girls um, with filler and with all these things done to our face, their faces. So I thought, well, if I want to be successful in that industry, if I want to be an influencer and I want to have a large following, I'm going to have to get that. Too. like I'm going to need to do that to my face I need jaw filler and cheek filler and lip filler and Botox to look the way these girls do um when actually what I, when I realize now is all just editing <laughs> none of them look mm. like that anyway <laughs> but um it's scary because it I, I wouldn't say I got addicted to it but uh by the age of 21 I didn't look like the same person I literally looked like a different person it was when I look back at pictures now I'm I'm terrified of myself. I'm like, who was that girl? I don't know what happened. And it was actually only until my sister said to me, she was like, we need to sort this out. It was, it took her to tell me. I was at um, a PA in, in a club. I don't remember where I was. And she texted me and she was like, I need to talk to you about the filler. Like it's too much now. Like it's, it's, it's enough. You need to stop. And then I actually sort of, I, I remember going on my front camera and I was looking, I was like, what's she talking about? And I actually realized, I was like, I don't, it's not nice this. It's, I, my face I literally everyone used to call me quagmire I don't even know who quagmire is I think it's like a cartoon character I don't know oh okay well people we'll would either quagmire say quagmire on the screen yeah quagmire <laughs> people used to say quagmire or they said I, I look like an xbox controller like my face was that warped like oh, I got all called all, all kinds of things um but there was this one pivotal moment where I'd gone and I'd got loads of filler and I posted a youtube video um and I hadn't let the filler sort of settle and it was really swollen and a picture from a, a screenshot from that video it trended on twitter 
desperate for weeks. It was horrendous. It was utterly horrendous. It was like, you can insert the picture, we'll send it to you. It was, my face was literally like, it was just awful. And it, it was, that was a moment for me as well, where I was like, I think, I think things need to change. I, I thought one day I'm actually, I'm going to get my lips dissolved in it. And it, it was a process. I went and got my lips dissolved and I posted about it on YouTube and I didn't expect the response that I got. It was huge. And a lot of girls were tweeting saying, made me laugh and was like, Molly Mae getting lip filler does not mean that we will have, um, getting her lip filler dissolved, sorry, does not mean that we will have to go and do the same. Because obviously they all love their lip filler, which I think is great. Like some girls absolutely love it. And by me getting my filler dissolved did not mean that I, I don't agree with filler. I got it at one point. Like I, I obviously loved it. Mm. And some girls it makes them feel super confident. And it did for me for a while until I took it too far. I think mm. it can be a great thing. It's not for me to sit here and bash it because some girls, they do feel amazing with it. And that's, that's great. But for me, um, the, the minute I started to sort of reverse my image and dissolve the filler and dissolve my lips. And I actually had full set of composite um, bonding, like veneers on my teeth. I had them removed as well. I literally took it to the extremes and I just stripped myself back. And weirdly, I felt the prettiest I'd ever felt once it had all gone and I, and I, I felt like I'd dropped about five years off my age and it was like it was a really really significant moment for me and I just stripping everything back and I didn't realize how much respect that would get me I didn't do it for respect I did it for myself I didn't do it for anyone else I did it because I knew that I needed to but from doing it all these young girls were like well all these young girls parents were emailing Fran and saying thank you so much like this is so amazing for us to see it's so different I actually had some a mum come up to me when I was visiting Hitchin with my mum she came up to me in the street crying her eyes out saying that she was so grateful to me for doing what I did with my filler because she's so happy that like the effect it had on her children and my mum started crying and it was all like emotions my mum was she, when the woman walked away, she was like, I'm so proud of you. And I just didn't realise, like, from me doing that, the effect it would have on so many people. Your manager, Fran, told me, she said, um, when you made that decision to remove the cosmetic filler and the, the, the bonding from your teeth, um, she was getting so many emails, she couldn't keep up with her inbox from yeah. parents saying, expressing their admiration and gratitude. Because obviously, previously, um, those parents and their children had been looking up to certain role models who do do a lot of editing because of, you know, because of the comparison based world we live in. Mm. And to have a, a role model like yourself who is taking the very, very brave and, um, brave is maybe not the right word, but just the very um, important step to say that I'm going to be a role model that doesn't um, tamper too much with my face because of the consequences and what that might tell my audience about yeah. themselves. When you went on your transition, when you went from being, you know, a little bit too much filler here, maybe in bonded teeth and stuff like that yeah. to the au natural Molly that you are now. Was there ever moments of doubt where you looked at yourself and thought, you know what, maybe I'll nip back and... Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it didn't happen overnight. I can't sit here and say like, I suddenly just felt incredible like it was a huge change like my I literally I look like a different person with all the filler in and a different person with it out and um there was a moment where I'd, I'd just done the cover for Cosmopolitan magazine and it was a really big deal to me I was so I remember hugely it. happy that I'd landed the cover because um I, it was a dream it's huge I, my mom used to buy me that magazine when I was younger and it was it was I couldn't believe that I was gonna be on the cover but that was the first time I'd been pictured after I'd had all the filler removed and I actually despised the picture so much that I I just I cried about it for days yeah I because I didn't get approval of the image and I just thought I sort of prayed I was like I really hope I like the image and I I absolutely hated it and it went it went out and it was fine and everyone was telling me how amazing I looked and, and it was kind of sad that after everyone sort of confirmed that they they thought I looked nice then I felt better that's mm. a bit sad because I think I didn't until I've until people sort of just started to say that. And I never really thought I was that girl. I always sort of thought, I don't need people to tell me that I look nice. Like, it, But I think then I did because I was really vulnerable. Like I just had all this filler removed. No one had really seen me like that. I looked really different. I did. And I think people noticed it, but people really admired it because it was different. Mm. It was new. No one had, no one had really done that yet. I, I wouldn't want to say that I started a trend, but I do feel like I did start a bit of a trend with the sort of dissolving. And I, again, I'm proud of that because yeah, I might've been a bit uneasy about it at first, but now loads of people are doing it and I love it. It's like a, an amazing movement. And with the, with the brands that you're involved in, in the businesses you run, do you now seek out models and influencers and creators that are representing that more natural look as well? I wouldn't even say so, because as I said before, 
I don't think filler's a bad thing. If it's done safely and it's done in a way that makes a girl feel more co- or a guy feel, feel more confident, then then that's great. Whatever makes that person feel amazing, that's what I like. And if mm. a model comes in and we like her and she's got a face full of filler, that's not a problem because another girl that's looking at that campaign also might have a face full of filler. You know, again, it's I don't really judge people based on things like that. I made a mistake with it once, and but at one point I loved it and mm. it did make me feel confident. So no, I think we just... Like when we look booking models for filter and things, we just want to be relatable and we want to sort of have a girl modeling our the fate hand that that lots of girls can relate to. That's why we use like always use multiple models in our campaigns and plus size and we 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 try and sort of cater to everybody. Imposter syndrome. When people rise very, very quickly into high places, they often talk about this feeling of imposter syndrome where they, you know inside them maybe they're still that girl from Hitchin but they're in these like big rooms with these big things talking about big ideas and do you ever feel that um I I guess I'm I'm extremely honest when I need to ask questions when I don't understand what the hell's going on like I actually said to Fran I was like I bet Stephen's going to use loads of words that I have no idea what they mean and I'm just gonna have to sit here and pretend that I have a clue what he's on about when really I don't. Has that happened yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but when I was listening to your one with Patricia Bright, you said a few words and I was like, don't know what that means. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, he's definitely gonna, that's going to happen. But I'm really honest. I'm really transparent. When I'll, I'll be in finance meetings with Fran and we'll be talking about gross profit. And I, and I say, can we just rewind? I have no idea what we're talking about here. And I'm really, really transparent with that. Like, I tried to just remember, I am 22. They didn't teach me this stuff in school. They, they really didn't. And I... I talking about mortgages and stuff. I didn't know what a mortgage was until a few months ago. I'll be honest, because when I started looking at buying a house, I was like, so what is a mortgage? Because I didn't know. And I think um, that's how I've sort of gotten away from that, like imposter syndrome. I just, I, I just ask, I just mm. ask the questions. I'm not embarrassed. And um, I've had to learn a lot really quickly. I didn't know anything at the start of this process. I didn't know, I don't think I, did, I hadn't earned enough money to even pay a tax bill before. Mm. I didn't understand. I was making a thousand pound a month before the show. So I'd never paid a tax bill like it. And I, it was, it was a lot of learning very quickly. And I've just always asked. I'm not afraid to ask. And then that's a really important thing. Don't be afraid to ask if you don't know. For me, that's, it's so inspiring to hear that answer because I've been in that exact same situation. I was in boardrooms as well when I was 22 years old and mm. you're sat there, you're, think, you're looking around the room and there's people double your age. And of course, it's easy to feel like um, you're inadequate or you're an imposter in that room. But the thing that I always fell back on was this understanding that I'm in that room for a reason. There's something that I have that those men that are double my age in suits that have gray hair don't have. And that's my specialty. That's the reason I'm there. Um, they have things I don't have. I have things they don't have. And I think for me, the thing that's made me feel comfortable in intimidating situations, whether it's Dragon's Den or being in boardrooms out of my depth at a very, very young age, is continually reminding myself that I am there for a reason too. And mm. there's something that I know. There's some, in your case, you know, unbelievable creativity and understanding of the customer that has put me there. And I think what you've realized is incredibly important. You don't have to speak on things you don't know. And as a young person, in these, in these very intimidating foreign situations like the boardroom, you don't have to pretend you know everything. You can just wait and have the confidence to speak on the things that you know well, that you know better than everybody. And I just think that's so incredibly important that when you are in intimidating situations as a young person in business or in your career, you got to know that you're there for a reason too. Yeah. You're, you're bringing value to that room too. You don't have to speak on everything but you are there for a reason. When, when I read about your story, when I, I've watched you over the years and I've been close to people that you're close to, um, I could not believe for the life of me when my team told me you were 22. I, like, I, I was like, yeah, sure. Like Googled it myself and I was like, Wikipedia is wrong as well. Because like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it, th- as you say, there are so many like fundamental things about business and funny, money and life and finance that must yeah. just now be like thrown at you and um and to be honest they're thrown at everybody right yeah. um especially when we you know we start thinking about mortgages and stuff mm. in terms of money and finance what are some of the lessons that you've you've had to learn um or the the advice you would give to people that are listening to make sure that they don't blow all their money and get end up in jail i don't think i'm the i'll be honest i don't think i'm there yet myself to give advice i'm still learning i i have yeah a a large amount of money for someone my age and I'm 
I have to sort of rely on people around me to advise me with it. Like I've just started investing, which has been a huge, interesting new chapter for me. I hadn't got a clue about investing, but I know it's really important. I knew it's a, it's a key thing and I need to do it. I didn't know where to start. Mm. So I've, I've been learning about that, which has been really interesting, but I know it is cliche and I know everyone says it, but because you don't learn these things in school, like it is so daunting. And my situation is so niche in that I came to a large amount of money so quickly and it was so vulnerable. Like I had to sort of like get my parents on board with it because I just, you, you trust all these people, but it, it was so scary. I'd say it's probably the most daunting thing really, like come now and this new world of like, I didn't have literally a pot to piss in before. And now I'm like dealing with these huge banks and they're like, it's, it's mental. It's, it's, I, and I don't want it. I wouldn't even give advice because I'm still learning and I'm not afraid to say that. Mm -hmm. I'm learning every day with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it is daunting. It's a whole new world. On the, we talked a little bit earlier about, we kind of touched on mental health. One of the things that I was really inspired by is you, you gave the profits from your, one of your PLT ranges to the charity Mind, the mental yeah. health charity. Yeah. Why did you do that? Well, it was, it was shortly after, Caroline Flack had passed away, um, which was obviously heartbreaking. And it was a huge, huge, huge shock. Um, and myself and PLT, we'd planned this huge launch party and a big launch dinner. And, and we, I was there getting ready for it. We cancelled it on the night because we just found out the news and it was just, it wasn't right. It just, it didn't feel right. And the only way I, it would feel right releasing the collection is if we did donate the, the profits made to, to Mind um, at that time. And it was just it was a really tricky time. And I think I'm so proud to to be a part of PLT in a way that they were so on board with it straight away. And mm. it was totally my idea. And I went to them and I said, this is what needs to happen. And they were like, yeah, it wasn't even a hesitation. It wasn't like, no, but we need to make money back. No, they they totally understood. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm blessed to work with PLT so closely because they're, they're just, they were amazing at that time. Was that one of the things on your proverbial mood board, becoming the creative director of PLT. Did you ever dream about that? What was the, and how did that all come about? Do you know, it, with Pretty Little Thing, it's it was crazy because I knew when I started working with them, it was like, I, I had this feeling that it was going to go bigger than I'd anticipated. We bought out these collections and bought out these edits and it was just growing and growing and my growth was, was going up and and it just wasn't slowing down. And I created such a close relationship with PLT and they, they we, we really understood each other. And it just grew past that point of being an influencer because I don't really count myself as an influencer anymore. I know I am theoretically, but it's more than that now. And I am more of a businesswoman. And I feel like PLT, it, it was in a, it was in the works for a while. There was conversations about this role. And um, I never really spoke about how it happened, but there was conversations about a role creative director was mentioned and I was like that's the only one I want I don't want anything else I don't want to be head of any other department creative director is my role and if not then we'll just carry on doing what we're doing or we'll see and um Fran worked on it with Uma and they spoke and they spoke and it was about six months in in discussion and then Fran rang me I was in my car and she was like we've got it you're, you're going to be the creative director of Pretty Little Thing and I was I it was a really like it was a crazy moment I screamed down the phone I was like oh my god like this is wild and I was just so excited to tell everybody. I had to wait a few months. Mm. I knew I was sitting on it for a while. And then I told everyone and it literally blew up the internet. I didn't expect it to have like the effect that it did, mm. but it was huge, literally huge. It was massive, yeah. I don't know, it was, yeah. I think it was just, no one really expected it. I think um, no one saw it coming. I think they probably just thought when I said I had a big announcement, they probably like, oh, it's just another collection. Mm. She's just bringing out a few more pieces of clothes. No, it was when I said I had the biggest piece of, like my biggest achievement. Yeah, I meant it. It was my biggest achievement yet. Like I'm not just an influencer anymore. I'm the creative director of Pretty Little Thing. Like that hasn't still really sunken in yet for me. And what does that mean? So the thing that brands do very well is they they like using, you know, influencers, creators to kind of sell, you know, we'll do a line with you, we'll do an edit with yeah. you. This is different, right? Yeah, it's completely different. Talk to me about how it's different. Well, I have a huge role within the business now. I have a huge voice within the business. And I think what's so amazing is that I am the consumer. I am that, their, their target market, really that age range. I'm, I'm, I am that consumer. So to have me in the business with my views, with my 
you know, with my guidance, like it's really helpful to them. It's a fresh pair of eyes. I think they really needed that. And I, I think um, because I know the brand so well and I've worked with them, I worked with them way before Love Island. I've worked with PLT now for heading on six years. Wow. They were the, one of the first businesses, one of the first uh, fashion companies that gifted me when I had about 11,000 followers on Instagram. So I've, I've just, we've believed in each other from the very start. So it was just such an organic movement for me, like just to, in that business. And another funny story is that when I came out of Love Island, I had this day where um, all these fashion brands, they came forward and they sat down and they offered me all these crazy deals. They, look, I'm not joking. There was probably about 15 of all my dream brands. They came in and they were like, we'll offer you this. We'll offer you a car. We'll offer you this amount of money. Um, and PLT didn't actually, it was Uma um, Zoom called me. They were actually the only one that didn't show up on the day, but they were the most important to me because I knew that I was like, it, these business meetings with all these other brands are kind of irrelevant because I know I want PLT. PLT wasn't the highest money offer that came forward. There were brands that came forward and offered me triple what PLT offered me. But because I love PLT so much and because I believed in them wholeheartedly and I knew that me working with them was going to be something the way it is now i i went with them and it was the best thing i ever did and what's the best what's for now you've been in that role for several months what's your what's your what do you enjoy most from because you've taken a big step from being you know doing ranges with them to now being inside the business yeah what surprised you what have you enjoyed well i think people wouldn't understand that the creative director role it wasn't just out of the blue it came about because i have been I've always given my input in everything that I've done. In every collection I've brought out, I've always done more than the average influencer. I think PLT saw that. I think they saw, hang on, this girl's actually got something to offer here. She's got ideas on every shoe. I have a large input with location, sets, um, you know, photographers, models that I use. Like it's, I've always never just sat back and said, yeah, that'll do. I'll do that. I've always had something to say. Um, so it was, I think they, they they saw that. And I think even things have changed so much now since I've come in this role, like the collections that I'm bringing out now, like they're worked on for a year. They're not, it's like, I mean, the one we've, we're bringing out next, it's, it's been working on, we've been working on it now for about seven months. So it's, um, things are done a lot more seriously. They're not rushed. They're really thought through, um, we're working, I don't know how much I can speak about it, but we're working on um, a London Fashion Week show, which has been in the works now again for about six months. Um, there's, it's a lot of work and it's interesting as well. Again, I'll sit here and I'll say, I'll be honest, it's a business role and I'm learning. I'm not, I don't know everything about business, you know, and a lot of, I got a lot of backlash when I came forward saying I was a new creative director. People were saying, well, what do you know about being a creative director? You've never been to university, mm. but it's not so much that I go in and I talk about numbers and I talk about the nitty gritty of like, that I'm more there to give my perspective on how things should be done. I'm there to go into the studios and say, I think this needs to be changed. I think this, you know, I'm there to be that fresh set of eyes and to be the consumer giving their voice. Mm. Um, that's sort of how it works. And Umar, you know, the founder and CEO of Pretty Little Thing, he himself started in that role when he didn't know anything about fashion other than, you know, you know, he's got links with his family, but that was his first real chance. And I, I've worked with him as well. And one of the things he's always said to me is he likes bringing people in that don't have experience. He, I've seen, I've sat in his office for many, many years and he said, we need more 16 year olds in here. Yeah. And what he's saying is, you've said is he wants fresh eyes. He wants a fresh perspective. He wants kids that understand TikTok. Yes. And keeping, and it's that's probably cute. why they've done so well and been so relevant. You know, you're is, so right. Mm. You're so right. When you go into the PLT office, it's all young girls working in there. All different kinds of girls, but all young. Mm. And it's, it's really interesting because there's like two sides to the office. You've got like the tech side, which are like, all the guys like yeah. working around their computers, yeah. like trying to make sure the website doesn't crash when they have a massive sale. Then you have like the side of things where it's like the young girls doing the TikToks, doing the tweets, doing the Instagram. It's huge. It's a, mm. it's absolutely, it's like, a, it's like an empire PLT. Yeah. Every time I go in that head office, I'm like blown away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if I didn't do what I did now, I'd want to work for PLT in a different way. Like I'd want to work in their social media because it's, in, it's an incredible job. Mm. All the girls that work there are so lucky. On the other side of the fence, I actually have a very unique perspective because I got to see, I was in the car with the CEO of PLT on the day when they were, he was trying so, so hard to make sure you join the brand. And yeah. I've never seen him um, so frantic and so, and you know, he was not going <laughs> to lose the opportunity to work yeah. with you. So yeah. I've never seen him like that, actually, in all the years. He's a very ambitious, relentless, very driven guy that you know knows what he wants and is willing to work to get it. But that day in that car, he was like, we need her. He was like, we need her. I can't let her go anywhere else. He must you know. have just seen something. I don't know. Maybe he just... He told me. 
Yeah. You represent, as you've said, you represent the customer. Yeah. You, rep- you know the customer. You are the customer. I am, yeah. And for him, it was like the stars had aligned and there could there wasn't another human being on earth that was more perfect for the brand than you. Mm. And it's funny to hear from your perspective because you felt the same way on the other side. So Yeah. It matched yeah. up quite nicely, I think. It matched up perfectly. Um life, you know, life life is very unpredictable and everything has a cost. We've talked a lot about that today. Even though the high points have a cost. And one of the costs of your um meteoric rise and your success and your openness has was um came out in the papers quite recently when someone broke into your home Mm, yeah one of the most unthinkable traumatic things um from a psychological perspective because that is your safe place it's your happy place it's yeah it's well especially the home that we were living in um it was i spoke about it in a youtube briefly really briefly because again i'm always too scared to say too much but it that home for me was I've had a lot of homes and it nothing quite was like that place for me it was just as it wasn't a huge apartment it was just a normal apartment um in a really nice area and ironically I I just always felt so safe there every time I went in and I locked the, the, the front door and I run myself a bath it was like my switch off zone it was like where I felt um like I could just be that 22 year old normal girl with a few thousand followers on Instagram like I felt like I just it was my haven so I think out of what happened with the burglary, I think that's been the hardest thing because that was snatched away from us. It wasn't, there wasn't the materialistic things that were taken. It wasn't all the possessions that were gone. It wasn't, the, the you know, them violating our space and it was ransacked. It wasn't any of that. It was the fact that I knew the second we found out we were in a, a meeting in London and we got the call and I, and I knew the minute I found out that we were going to have to leave. And I just, it was, that was the most heartbreaking thing for me because to be forced out of your home that you love so much and that you weren't ready to leave anytime soon it was like it was heartbreaking it was awful it says a lot about what home is it's not really a place I guess it's a set of emotions right a hundred percent and once, once those emotions are tampered with and once they're spoiled it's gone like it's not it's just it's just bricks and more than it's not it isn't it's not a special place anymore and I think yeah out of everything that happened that's been what I've been finding hard to deal with because we um when I drive past it and stuff it's it's heartbreaking it's like god that is how quickly can things change like things can change in such a like a few hours everything had changed like I was in a meeting about something really exciting in London next thing you know your house has been ransacked everything's been taken you need to come home right away and I just didn't know what to expect I just expected the worst and it was a good job that I did because it it was bad everything everything gone how did Tommy react well, it was, it's tricky because I'll be honest, Tommy, he's different with how he spends his money. He, he doesn't really buy things. <laughs> he's a bit of, um, the way he's been raised, he's, he's quite shrewd with his, he's just, he's, we're very different. And, um, he reacted differently to me. I was, um, much more like, um, trying to sort everything out, you know, insurance and making sure we're, we're okay. And Tommy's just like, sort of it'll be fine it'll be fine he's very laid back it's very hard to explain how he is but we're like polar opposites but that's why we work but yeah I mean it was just different and is this you've talked about how this has changed your desire and willingness to be as open yeah which I find I found to be quite well I had no yeah I had no choice and I mentioned that like on my social media I said like I don't want to change the way I live I don't want to change the way I talk to you guys that's what I love doing I love sharing everything but if it's going to compromise my safety I can't I can't it's not fair like it's really hard and I'm now trying to work on this new balance of sharing but not oversharing to so that I um make me and Tommy not safe anymore and it's it's finding this new way of living and having close protection security now and and moving and making sure not even my nail tech so much as comes to my house because I I can't have anybody knowing where I live now. It's like even delivery, no, can't. It's not possible. Like it's just not safe because it takes one wrong person to know where you live. And I and I think I've. It, do you know what? I I will say that it is not a positive thing what happened, but maybe it needed to happen in order to make me learn how I need to be now. I can't just be that normal girl that is blasé and posts everything on her socials it's not I need to look I need to do better to protect myself and Tommy unfortunately it's sad but it's just the way it's got to be now and everything's got to change yeah 
That is sad, isn't it? It is sad. It is. But I think people understand. They, I see a lot of tweets now being like, because I've posted, I mean, literally a smidgens of where we live now. Like, I mean, like a cushion. And everyone's like saying, I'm so gut, we're not going to get a house tour. And I'd absolutely love to give a house tour because this house is incredible. And I want to, I don't want to show it off. I want to show my followers and be like, this is where we're living now. This is the new kitchen. This is the new bedroom. You know, like I, that's me. I'm an oversharer. But now I'm I'm taking videos and I'm like, God, is that too much? Am I showing too much there? Like I've, the newspaper's going to find out from right move which house that is. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that way now. And it's sad at 22 years old that you have to think that way, but it's the pros and cons with this, this new life that I'm living. Do you feel safe in your new home? Yeah. You do. Yeah, we, we're really lucky in that, as I said, it's taught us how we need to be now. And I actually have close protection security now and I'm trying to get used to that. It's 24, 24 oh, yeah. 7. And I'm, I don't know how long I, I, or if forever or whatever, but I'm, it's just mad like that we're having to put these precautions in place now. Um, I don't really wear my jewellery anymore. What I have left of it, I'm, I'm not wearing it because I just, it made me realise that it just doesn't really matter. People are just so cruel and, and, and they are jealous that these things, it's better off just to, I don't know. I, I just think it changed things for me. It took that superficialness away. It just made me realise actually these things aren't important. Your health and your happiness and your safety. Safety is key. I'm spending a fortune now on security, but really there's no price on feeling safe mm. at all because I'd rather spend money on security than spend it on a handbag. Mm. Because what makes you feel better now? The security, of course, because I can go down the street and know I'm okay, I'm safe. I don't know. It's it's changed a lot. Are there things that you miss from your old life? Old life is in... As in, you know, before the before all the uh, paparazzis in the Caribbean or wherever it was. And No, the... I wouldn't say so, you know. I, I, I love my life now. I'm a, I literally, I, I pinch myself every day that this is the life I live. And yeah, like things like, the burglary happened and it's shit and it's scary and I have bad days but I'm so blessed to live this life like I, I pinch myself every day that I wake up and I I, I never want to go back to my old life that terrifies me because mm. obviously as I told you at the start that ordinary life that I was living before I never wanted that I want what I had now and I, what I'm working on achieving so if you were to, to to leave your house and just walk through a mall or down the street now mm. what's that experience like it's different it's I, I, I never really talk about that because it sounds big head of me. You're like, you do get stopped, but it's it, it's mental and it's crazy. And like, it, it will never feel real, especially when I go out with Tommy. Obviously he's tall, everyone spots Tommy. Mm, mm. <laughs> and he has um, a really different audience to me. So it's like when I'm walking through like a shopping center, his audience is in there and my audience is in there. So it's like a yeah. huge amount of people. And obviously our combined following when we go out, it's heading on 10 million mm. people. That's a lot of people. So it's a lot of people that know who you are and want to grab pictures. And it's amazing. It is amazing. And I, I one thing I always say is that I never, ever, ever in my whole career ever said no to a picture because I just, I like it. It's fun. It's nice that people like want to take a picture of you. Like what an honor, like that someone wants to take a picture of me. Like that will never feel real. But is then I went out with them. Um... My, my mate Liam Payne from One Direction and obviously I've experienced I met I mean, him before you know oh really yeah on a plane we were flying back from um, Vegas together at the same time he was oh, so really? lovely to me and Tommy and like has always stayed in contact with Tommy since and messages him and says I like, hope you're well brother and like, I really didn't expect that oh, from I know. him yeah he's a, he's, sweet, he's a really sweet guy under there uh, you know when I say under there I mean just underneath all of the like the fame and the public image and the boy band stuff he's this really sweet soul it's cool yeah my, I went out with him a couple of times in Manchester for the foot. We did a couple of parties together for the Euros, just getting our close friends together and um, sit in a restaurant in the Ivy in Manchester. One person, find, you know, clocks that it's Liam That's Payne. It then, yeah. Comes over, <laughs> can we have a photo? He's like, sure. Another, And then they go back to their table and tell their table. Then there's another person. Yeah. And then the dinner is actually a meet and greet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thinking, because like, I'm like, no, I'm not famous at all. But like, I've got like dr Dragon's Den is dropping in January and things like that. So I'm thinking, I don't want that in my fucking life. Like, yeah. that is too much for me. And how do you find, how do you find those moments where you can enjoy yourself in public without it becoming a Molly Mae meet and greet? It or do it, you just choose to go to other places? I just choose not to go out, I'll be right. honest. Uh, and I think sometimes it has to take Fran to say to me, 
going to the Trafford Centre on a Saturday afternoon in Manchester is not a smart idea as much as I would like to. Um, even like the Christmas market just opened in Manchester. Hmm. We were going to go the other night, but we were like, no, it's a bad idea. Like, it sounds like you're being big-headed when you say it, but you just... I mean, someone come out with me and see, like, it's not it's not like a normal experience. It's, you have to take security. You have to, it's not like a just quick nipping out. It's a lot. It sounds you like you've got you a baby. Could. It sounds like you're yeah, trying yeah. to get a baby ready. You're yeah, not just yeah, nipping yeah. out. It's a lot to think about. Quick one. As many of you know, I've been trying to make my life a little bit more sustainable as it relates to energy ever since I sold my Range Rover Sport and bought an electric bicycle. And my energy as a sponsor of this podcast, one of the brands that make that transition much, much easier. They are at the forefront of British renewable eco smart technology and their products are really, really changing the game. If you're on YouTube, you can see what I'm holding in my hand. This is called the Eddy, right? It's the UK's number one solar power diverter. So what is a solar diverter? It's a device for people like you and me that means you can divert your excess energy back into your home rather than back into the grid, which will save you power and money. It's super user-friendly and easy to install and you can control it using the My Energy app on your phone. To find out more about this product and more products like it that will help you make that sustainable transition, head over to myenergy.com and... Um, I highly recommend you check out the Eddie. It's um, it's a real game changer for a product and one that I'm going to be installing in my home soon. What's it like being a, a woman in business, right? Because there's, there's, you know, especially when you're a woman that's come from, um, you know, built this big Instagram following and it's been on a TV show. There's so much like stigma, stereotyping and assumptions being made, right? But out, even outside of your, your role as creative director of PLT, you are a businesswoman at your very, at the core of it. You're, yeah. you're, you're dealing with multiple brands across multiple deals and yeah. you've got your own companies. What is it like being a woman in business at 22? It it's, it's hard. I mean, it's confusing and it's hard. It's amazing, obviously. But as I said, like I am learning. So it's um, a little bit scary at times. You do feel a little bit like overwhelmed. And when you're in meetings and you're, you, you don't want to look like you don't know what's going on. You don't want to look vulnerable. You mm. just have to sort of come across as, as this woman that you, you, you do have all your shit. You all have mm. your ducks in a row. You know what's going on. And um, by sort of like pretending that I do, I feel like I've sort of become oh, that, that yeah. I, I've, I've sort of like embodied someone that does know what's going on because I've had to learn it so quickly and sort of mm. someone's pretend that I've now embodied that person that I, when I'm in a meeting, I can hold my own and I can mm. sit there and say, yeah, I know what's going on. I want to do this, this and that. It hasn't come overnight. Mm. Um, as I said, like, I am so young and it's such a quick turnaround. Like two years ago, I was in Manchester, I was in Manchester and living by myself, going to the gym, taking a few pictures, going to Wagon Mamas on a weekend, like it. And now I'm in these huge meetings with huge people. <laughs> important subjects and it's like god it's it's 
it's hard sometimes, but I like it. It's interesting. It's different. Every day in my life is so different mm. and it's a bit of a challenge each day. It's like, even today, mm. like this, this, this podcast, I felt honored that you even asked me to do it because it's like, I'd listened to the people that you'd done them with. And I, and I, you sort of sometimes think, God, like I'm not the same as them, but then it, you sort of realize, oh wait, maybe I am, mm. you know, like the likes of Patricia Bright and Jacqueline Gold, like you look up to people like that. And then suddenly you're being asked to do the same things as them. And it's like, how has that happened? Like it, it mm. I don't know if it will ever feel real, things like that. Mm. Patricia Bright is especially someone I've always looked up to. And I actually filmed, I've been working with Patricia a few times now. And that was really huge for me because she was like my woman. She was like my goals. <laughs> yeah, she was the woman on YouTube. And, and I aspired to just be just like her. She's just everything I wanted to be. She was so successful, so business-minded, but also so relatable and so hilarious and, I loved everything that she was about. And then she asked me to do a video with her after love. And I was like, no, this is just not happening. And then you try and act cool and you try and act like this is just the normal, but it, it's not, it's not. And it's sometimes okay to sit there and be like, oh God, I cannot believe this is happening. Like even today, like when Fran was talking to me about doing this with you and it's just like, these things just, I don't know, they don't ever really feel real. What do your parents think about your life? They must be looking at it and thinking, what the? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it is crazy. Like when they see me doing my pretty little thing adverts on TV, like how does that ever feel normal? And they're just, they're just really, really proud. They're just, my, my parents are divorced now. Um, so it's dealing with my dad and dealing with my mum is like two separate, completely different things, but they're both so, they're both so proud of me. And it's just, I don't think anyone could really have expected this. Do you, do you sometimes see them or feel them trying to work out what they did to cause you to be like trying to connect the dots back to like what the like, yeah, like in hindsight maybe. Like, what, what did we do like what did, yeah. what did you feed her like <laughs> I, yeah I don't know but I, I don't think that I think obviously you're a product of your environment and, and how you grow up and how you're raised is a huge part of who you become but at the same time I wouldn't like no disrespect to my parents they're incredible but I don't think anything they've done made me do what I've done now if mm. that makes sense mm everything I've done in the last two years is down to me and down to Fran. It's, it's us two together. Like we've done this and that my parents, yeah, they raised me and they made me into a, a polite and nice person, but they, they're not responsible. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Like they're yeah. not, I don't know how yeah. you feel about that, but you probably don't feel like your parents are the reason that you've been so successful or well, maybe yeah. you do. I don't know. Well, it's funny because with parents, like we, I have, I'm, I'm the youngest of four oh, are you? and we're all completely different. Yeah. So, it would be pretty dumb to say that there was a ton of intention that went mm. in for my parents. They were thinking, we'll raise one entrepreneur, one yeah. lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> one dentist. You know, it's just, they, they do their best yeah. and it's like rolling the dice. Yeah. Right? And you, as you've said from your family, your sister's in the army, you're, you know, this mega star um, businesswoman and a creator. So you never really know what's going to happen. And, I, you know, it'll be the same someday when I have kids and when you have kids, I'm sure it's kind of a rolling of the dice. Yeah. Luck of the draw. Speaking of kids. Speaking of relationships, Tommy. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, you know, when people leave Love Island, you, you kind of look at it and you think, oh, these are just gimmick relationships, right? Yeah. We think that they're in it for the money. They're not going to last for five days. And then the minute they leave Love Island, the relationship's over after they've done all like the deals and stuff together. <laughs> yeah. And everyone's like, yeah, we understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 With you and Tommy, again, you've been an anomaly. Yeah, we that, have. Because you're still together. Um, years and years and years, years after the show. And from everything I've read, you have a really solid relationship. Tell mm. me about that. And I guess you didn't expect that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think as I mentioned briefly before, because I went on the show so not expecting to find love and I just went on for a bit of a, we'll just see what happens. Potentially come out with a million followers. We'll see. I came out the only person having fallen in love. Me and Tommy were the only couple that year that are still together. Um, and that were really together in the show. Every other couple broke up a couple of weeks after. We were the only people that actually found each other properly. And it's been like nearly three years now and it's just been a whirlwind. And I think what's been so incredible is that both our lives have changed together at the same time and we've grown together and experienced mm -hmm. it all with one another. And I think having him to lean on through all these, you know, ups and definitely lows he's been there for me has been so amazing because it would have been lonely doing it alone I think mm. like you know after me and Fran have spoken all day and then going back to that apartment alone when you're living this new world and navigating all these new things like it would have been a bit sad uh, to not experience it with someone so we're really blessed to have had each other through this whole thing and is it is it at times quite a long distance relationship because if he's yeah. away fighting in or training in the US yeah or you know he's with Tyson doing some training which I saw recently 
is it is it a bit of a long distance relationship at yeah. times? And how do you manage that? We don't see each other for weeks on end at the moment, like weeks on end. Um, and we've become really good at the long distance thing. I don't know, like I think we're just, one thing that I find so key in our relationship and it's the most important thing I think in any relationship is trust. We have that complete and utter trust in one another. And I think in a relationship, that is literally all you need to survive. If you've got that trust, everything else just falls into place because he can literally go away for weeks on end. And there's not a doubt in my mind that if he was to be around a load of girls it, it I, I could sleep peacefully at night knowing that he's just he's for me and I'm for him and that's that when you've got that I just think I don't know why I'm giving a relationship advice here but no, I do but think like that is the key job. that is literally the key you've got trust you've got everything yeah. and relationships else. require work right we had a guest on the other day and he said something which I actually actually spun my head a little bit he said you know um in a relationship there is the relationship and there's love you only have to work on one of them which means like you, you know what I mean you the relationship is like a a job in the sense that you've got to like invest in it, nurture yeah. it, commit to it. Whereas the love is going to be there and you can, yeah. you can see it because some people have loads of love and a crap relationship. Yeah, right? that's true. So what what work do you do with Tommy on the relationship to make sure that you are, yeah, like working on it actively to protect <laughs> I never it? pictured it like that. I guess we mm. you do work in a relationship. It is like a bit of a full-time job mm. that never ends. Um, it just comes naturally. I think when you're with the right person, it, it does just all fall into place and, I don't know with it's it's weird with him like we know that we're going to be together forever and we we we're just so excited for what the future holds for us all we ever talk about is kids and like marriage and we're, I'm so excited like I'm doing all these amazing things but I also have that to look forward to and we I don't see our relationship as a job like your other person mm. said I, I don't I just see it as a part of my life and it's just there and I'm so blessed that it, it just works so well. We never have any problems. We're really lucky. Obviously, we're not perfect. I'm yeah, not going to yeah. sit and say we don't yeah, yeah. argue like cat and dog. We definitely do. Right. He drives me crazy. And I do feel like I'm a bit of his manager sometimes. The way Fran is for me, I am for him. It's like passed down. Um, Fran does it for me. I do it for him. He just looks after himself. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like it, we've just got something good going on. It really works. As we look ahead then at your future... You're very ambitious. You're always asking that question, what's next? What's yeah. next? What's next? You've made that, you know, that mood board, that planning session with Fran recently, you know, in the previous couple of months as to what the next big goals are. What are they, big goals and ambitions? Well, specifically, I wouldn't, I'd, I always try and keep things under wraps a little bit because I- I've spoken to Fran, she said, you can tell me everything. Oh. <laughs> not sure if that's true um well in all aspects of my life I'm working on different things um pretty lot of thing and me we're it's a, as I said 24 7 it's a constant thing and we're working on um London Fashion Week is next and that I'm not gonna say too much because I do really want to keep it mainly a secret but it's going to be huge like the biggest thing maybe PRT is maybe ever done um so that's going to be huge we're working on that then obviously I've got Fields by Molly May which is my own fake tan business which is growing rapidly and when I spoke about in this pod podcast a lot about learning the business side of things that's what I'm relating it to is my business when I go into these meetings with these people you know like um wholesalers that want to take on the the product and sell it on their websites and I'm it's it's just interesting to learn and I, I'm just looking forward to learning more like I, and I'm, I'm as I said I'm not shy to sit here and say that I've got so much more to learn I I'm not like the likes of Jacqueline Gold and the Patricia Bites that sit here and they've got a few years on me and they've learned all this stuff and they they do come across like these strong powerful business women and I'm I aspire to be like that and I'm heading there mm. and I'd love to revisit this in a few years when I'm yeah. there <laughs> and um can use all those big words like net gross profit all that <laughs> shite <laughs> I don't know how it's to really use. interesting with you because I actually think you have you've clearly demonstrated the thing that will get you there which is that humility of like admitting that there's a lot of things you don't know mm. and I think of when it's speaking as someone that was once a very young entrepreneur as well at 22 years old I didn't know anything about anything because you, you're right no one tells you business stuff no. and net gross profit margins and that score. makes me feel better no but 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 the most important like com key component I think in entrepreneurs is being like there are so many things I don't know and I'm not going to pretend I don't because as you said and one of the things that really actually inspired me when you said it was listen if I don't know something I just ask it mm. that's the for me, the mindset of someone who's going to in the future know a lot of shit. Like, yeah, do you know I what I mean? So yeah. You... So tell me more about the future then. What else has it got going on? You've got your your brand, the the tan business. You've got loads of stuff happening with your creative director role at PLT. Yeah. Well, obviously my socials. I'm I'm growing twenty five thousand a day on average. Wow. Um, it's not stopping, and it, it's it's strange to me. Like I, 
when I came out of the show, I never anticipated the growth. Just It just doesn't stop. Like, mm. and I could even disappear for a few weeks and I, it doesn't stop. And I don't know why. I think it's just people, they do find me so relatable and, and I'm just... I'm excited to see with like what happens as I grow. Like, where is it going to stop? Mm. You know, and I has every every million I hit, I'm I'm like, well, I want the next million now. Mm. So now I'm working towards seven million. Even though when I said I hit six million, that would be enough. I was like, <laughs> six million, wow, that would be amazing. And now I'm like, nah, seven millions next. That will be enough. And then it won't be. Then I'll be working towards ten. Um, Does but focus not become a problem when you know now because of how big your platform is, you could pretty much go after any goal or ambition you have with your manager Fran yeah so how like you there's there is a you know a risk of spreading yourself too thin right I guess so but there is a still there are there are still goals that are a little bit like for everybody there's things that are a little bit out of reach and I like reaching for those things because it's you know I you know, working with like really, really high end fashion brands, you know, we've not tapped into that yet because- Oh, here we go. Do you know, well, I, we don't know yet, but it's just interesting to think about the different types of, of brands that I can work with. You know, I'm working more on like the high street budget right now. And then, you know, in years to come, who's to say where that's gonna, you know, you just don't know. And I think with my following growing so rapidly, where is it gonna end up? We just mm. don't know, but that's what's so exciting about it. Like, it's just every day is a new, is a new chapter. I know it sounds so cringy, but it is. Every day is so different. Well, yeah, my next, my my main goal has been my main goal for the last two years. I'm just desperate to own a house. I still don't own a house yet, but it's not because I can't or I don't want to. It's because I've not found the right house yet. And um, I'm so particular and picky with what house I want. Um, it's come, it's come close a few times to like, I've got my mortgage in principle and it's been all really exciting. And then it's no, but I, yeah, that's my next goal is, is, getting on the property ladder and maybe building a house. We don't know. It's There's loads of exciting things with that. And I'm st still trying to learn again, mortgages and all that interesting stuff. It's just, um, stamp duty. What the hell is that? And you, why on earth does that exist? <laughs> May I ask? Because <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's loads of things that you don't realise. Because mm. I, I, I looked at this house and, and I really, really liked it. And I was like, yeah, you know the stamp duty on that's going to be X hundred thousand. And I was like, what? And then I had a builder come around and look at all the work that I want doing to it. And he was like, yeah, so that's going to be about 900,000 just for the work you want doing. And I was like, this is just stupid. I was like, that, like how, but this is the thing, like I'm in a really financially um, blessed situation. So how is any normal 22 year old on a normal income ever going to get on the property ladder? Mm. I don't understand that. That's mm. fascinating to me. How's anybody ever going to get on the property ladder with the way it's going? Mm. It's wild, isn't it? So this is the di this is the actual diary of a CEO. Oh okay? wow! Amazing. This is the famous diary where it all began, and every guest that comes on the podcast, um, when they leave, they write a question for um, the guest that's coming up. Oh, right. So you actually won't know who's written this question for you. And I, oh, actually, and I guess it wouldn't be like it wasn't your recent one, Patrice Evra. It wouldn't be that, would it? Because we've had a couple since then. They probably come out in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we've had, you know, Jimmy Carr came out. We've had some some very big um, guests recently. And you'll also be writing a question in this book for our next guest. Okay. So the question in the Diary of a CEO for you this week from our previous guest was, if you had to give all of your money to one organization tomorrow morning, what organization would it be and why? I mean, there's so many charities, like, and so many things that come to mind. It's almost like I can't even think of one but one thing I didn't speak about in this podcast is that I am a massive um I always give money to homeless people always mm. I cannot keep cash in my wallet because I will literally just dish them out like fun coupons to, mm. to I can't I just I have to when I see anybody on the street I give my money away instantly because mm. I cannot fathom how anybody can end up in that situation of of not having a home it literally breaks my heart so I'd probably, I'd probably just find someone on the street and give it all to them. Wow. Yeah, I honestly would, or, or give it to a homeless organisation or, or something like that, because it is a hard question, but yeah. that's something that I feel really passionate about. Mm. And as I said, I just, I have to stop putting cash in my wallet because I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. the minute I get out of the cash point, it's gone mm. to someone on the street, which I like doing. I, I enjoy doing that. It's, I don't know, it's a really hard question, like... It is. I like. I. De I. Like, what I would, have to would you probably, say? Well, because you're right, right. So it's. It has. To, it's a really considered thing. To, My question is going to be like, "What are you having for your dinner tomorrow?" <laughs> no. Yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> <Sports> <laughs> <for tea. laughs> no. It's. Uh, yeah. I would. I would. 
I would probably do the same as what you did there, which is like, what causes, what, what hurts my heart and what, what problem would I like to solve if I was like either vanishing off the earth tomorrow or just having to donate everything. And yeah, I would people that don't have stuff. Yeah. So I'd probably sell all my assets and give it to, I don't know, one of these organizations that helps people that don't have stuff, like, which yeah. is pretty much what you said there. So makes a lot of sense. If you, if you could speak to Molly May um, from Hitchin mm. now, based on everything you've been through and everything you've learned, what, what kind of things would you tell her about, warn her about, advise her on looking back? That's a good question. I think I, without repeating myself with what I've said before in the past, I, I do wish I could tell her to slow down a little bit with rushing things. And even now it's something that I'm trying to work on at 22. I don't want to get to 25 and and not have anything to look forward to when I'm 30 because I've done everything already. You know, have the best car I can drive and have the best house. I want to slow things down and I, and I want to work on enjoying where I'm at because it's not healthy to always, always want more because you've got to be grateful for where you're at and the things you've achieved. Um, but Fran's a really good person for that because she grounds me like, it's a really superficial example, but I'll use it anyway. I passed my driving test a few months ago and the only car I wanted was a G-Wagon. I was like, I'm getting a G-Wagon. Fran was like, no, you're not. I was like, why not? She's like, yeah, you can get a G wagon, but what have you got forward to look? What have you got look, got to look forward to when you hit twenty five? Like, she was like, get something a little bit, you know, underneath that, and then you can look forward to it when it comes. And I was like, no, no. But then I thought, actually, you're right. I don't need to just always go for the biggest thing. Like, work towards these things, have things to look forward to because I'm only twenty two. Like, I'm so young and I've got so much to work on and look forward to, and I don't want to rush things. And I would tell my younger self, slow down. Slow down on the filler, slow down on moving to Manchester, maybe when you couldn't afford it. Slow down on worrying about trying to get Instagram followers. And it's just, everything will come, you know, in it, when it's meant to. And do you think you are, you feel like you, going back to one of the questions I spoke about earlier, do you feel like you are enough now? Like you've achieved enough and you've done enough and to be, to be happy, you, you know, do you feel like you're enough? Oh, it's, it's a really, really good question. I honestly... I'm going to say no, because then it just contradicts everything I've said in this podcast well, if I say yes. and But but no, I would say no, because if Fran or someone told me today that this was the last day of me working and I'll go back to Manchester now and I'll sit in my house and have babies and get married and I won't work another day, I'd cry myself to sleep and I would not be happy because I'm nowhere, as I said, I'm nowhere near done. This is just the start. So no, like I'm not, I am enough, me, I am enough, but the work I've done isn't enough yet. I've got so much more to do. Will it ever be? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe when we, if we re ever revisit this and I've got more followers and more money and a better house or whatever, I'll still be saying it's not enough. I probably will be. But maybe I need that. Maybe that's like the recipe to making me the way I am and making me different to the other Love Islanders and the other influencers. Maybe it is because I'm hungry and I always want more. So maybe I don't need to get rid of that. Maybe I'll just stick with that mindset because <laughs> it works clearly. <laughs> I completely agree. And it's been incredibly inspiring and insightful talking to you because, you know, you're, inc I, can't, I still can't believe you're 22 years old because, you know, at 22 years old, I wasn't, I wasn't in the rooms that you're in now. And I wasn't in, engaged in the conversations. I hadn't built businesses and, you know, the role at, as at PLT as creative director, I know how demanding that, that will be and um, how particular and cautious Umar would have been in picking you. He wouldn't mm. have done it as a token thing. No. And I've, I've actually spoken to the team at PLT. I've, I actually worked with them for about seven years. Yeah. And um, with, through my business. And um, they say that you are heavily, heavily involved during the office and you are helping to build and shape what that brand is. Yeah. It's remarkable that you can do all of that and run all of your other businesses and, uh, you know, keep up with your personal life as well all at the age of 22, there's a real mature wise head on your shoulders. And it's really fascinating to watch how that's going to play out for you over the coming years. And I, you're a force, right? So I can't think of anything getting in your way. Um, thank you so much. No, thank, thank you for your you. honesty. Thank you. You're doing a real service to the world and being yourself. And I know how, I, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know because I have people hold me to a, they don't hold me to the same standard as they hold you, but you're doing a real service, I think, to a younger generation by being a relatable role model, one that is incredibly real, honest, open, and um, yeah, an all round nice person. Thank you. Thanks for having this conversation with me today. Cause yeah, I've been, I've watched your career and your rise with total fascination and uh, I would bet on you for the future. So you're a formidable businesswoman in person. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Thanks very, for coming. Very grateful to be on the podcast.
Quick one, can you do me a favor if you're listening to this and hit the subscribe button, the follow button, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Me and my team use that as an indication of whether the episode is good or not based on how many new followers and subscribers we get. Thank you so much. Thank you.